Good morning. My name is Randa Noble, and I'll be reading the scripture for today, which is 2 Samuel chapter 8. In the course of time, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them, and he took Methagamoth from the control of the Philistines. David also defeated the Moabites. He made them lie down on the ground and measured them off with a length of cord. Every two lengths of them were put to death, and the third length was allowed to live. So the Moabites became subject to David and brought him tribute. Moreover, David defeated Adahazer, son of Rehob, king of Zohab, when he went to restore his monument at the Euphrates River. David captured a thousand of his chariots, 7,000 charioteers, 20,000 foot soldiers. He hamstrung all but 100 of the chariot horses. When the Armenians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, the king of Zobah, David struck down 22,000 of them. He put garrisons in the Armenian kingdom of Damascus, and the Armenians became subject to him and brought tribute. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David took the gold shields that belonged to the officers of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. From Teba and Barathai, towns that belonged to Hadadezer, King David took a great quantity of bronze. When Tu, king of Hamath, heard that David was defeated the entire army of Hadadezer, he sent his son Joram to, the king, to King David to, tr <clears throat> to greet him and congratulate him on his victory in the battle over Hadadezer, who had been at war with Tu. Joram brought with him articles of silver, of gold, and of bronze. King David dedicated these articles to the Lord, as he had done with the silver and the gold from all the nations that he had subdued, Edom and Moab and the Amorites and the Philistines and Amalek. He also dedicated the plunder that was taken from Hadadizer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And David became famous after he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He put garrisons throughout Edom, and all the Edomites became subject to David. And the king, <coughs> and the Lord, da and the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David reigned over all of Israel, doing what was just and right for all of his people. Joab, son of Zeruiah, took over the army. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahalid, was recorder. Zadok, son of Ahatub, and Am Amalek, son of Abitar, were priests. Zariah was secretary. Benaniah, son of Joadah, was over the Carathites and Pelathites, and David's sons were priests. Rand, you want to reread some of those names because I missed. Them. <laughs> I missed a few. I missed a few at the end. You want to reread some of those? When I was at Ted's Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, I had a teacher, well-known teacher named D. A. Carson. I took five classes from him, and they were by far my hardest classes. He was not a jokester. He would walk into class very seriously. Immediately, the room would quiet down. He would kind of tip his glasses down just to look around the room, like, are you ready? Is what I always took it as. He, had, he was uh, Canadian by birth, married an English woman when he was at Cambridge, spent lots of years overseas. He is an amazingly gifted scholar in his late 70s now, uh, stepping away from everything as is embracing his finitude, and it is a huge loss to our church as a whole, but yet he's a, the Lord has used him in his ways. But he would, he would begin class just with this stern look because he knew what he was doing. And he would say this over and over again. I'm, he, would, he would say, these are my words. I'm not here to play games. I'm not here to be your bud. I'm here to minister to your congregations. And I'm doing that through you. And he would be, he was so intense. I remember I, I could not get an A in his class. I got four A minuses in a row. Finally, in my last class with him in my last year at Ted's. And I knew, I mean, I knew he thought my work was good. He, I think probably he alone is the one that got me accepted into the UK because he was willing to write a reference. So I knew if he was willing to write a rev because he, he said no to almost everybody who asked for a reference. So I kind of went up assuming he's going to tell me no. And he's like, I will. That's all he said. I don't know. <laughs> So, I mean, that was positive, and he was very encouraging for me to go on to, to more studies. So, I'm in my last class with him. There were three assignments. There were two exams and a paper. Now, the first exam, I got an A. 
On the only paper, I got an A. And the last exam was anywhere in First and Second Corinthians translation. And those are not easy texts. And you had no idea. I literally stayed up the entire night. My wife's like, are you coming to bed? I said, DA is keeping me up. I cannot come to bed. And I translated through First and Second Corinthians twice in one night. Couldn't eat breakfast because I was so nervous. I show up on a Thursday morning, the morning of the exam, took the exam, and then I had to go in to meet with him. He was giving me the academic reference for PhD. And I said to him, Dr. Carson, probably you shouldn't have been smiling. I'm sure, I've got two A's. I, I, how did I do my exam? He goes, I'm giving you an A minus. <laughs> I said, but the A minus is the exam, but two A's, that's an A, right? I'm sorry, your grade for the class is an A minus. <laughs> and I just kind of look down and he goes, Mr. Klink, you are an A minus student. <laughs> but then he looked at me and it's the only time I saw him smile. And he says, but don't worry, I never give A's. <laughs> well, he had a saying that I have never forgotten. He would say a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. That's what he would say over and over again. A text, a biblical text, without a context is a pretext for a proof text, meaning you're going to misread it. If you don't put the Bible or any particular passage in a particular context, guess what you'll do? You'll abuse it. So now you come to a text in 2 Samuel chapter 8 that's kind of graphic. That's got names that you don't want to have anybody ever try to read again. That has killing and hamstringing and all these kind of things. And I can see Dr. Carson with his glasses down looking at me saying, a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. So we need to make sure that this morning we put this text in its context. And I would not be able to do that as well if it were not for him. Let's pray. Father, we, we sit under your word and we come, some of us broken, some of us just tired, some of us fearful, some of us anticipating something exciting. I can't imagine the range of responses coming in here this morning as we sit and we open up your word which we believe and we know is true it's living and breathing it is your gracious accommodation to us teaches us it rebukes and corrects it encourages and we want to hear from it and we need it we need more of it, your words help us this morning like our brothers and sisters before us to sit under your word and to glean from it what you want to say to your people. I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. I, I actually summarized the whole passage in that first point and then in the second point this morning I'm going to hone in on what I think is the major theme. And I think it's the major theme because it's actually stated twice specifically. <laughs> But, but here's what I think the major theme is. Again, there's Carson saying, read the text in its context. What God promised to do, he indeed will do. Read in isolation, this text seems cruel. It even seems extreme. In the context of 2 Samuel, though, and, and specifically the chapter preceding this one, it makes much more sense. Let me explain. God promised that he would provide for his people through his chosen king. He wasn't joking around. He wasn't just saying that and not good on his promise. I'm going to read to you what we, said, what we read recently in 2 Samuel 7, verses 8 to 11. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Man, when you hear those words, it's like, this is the promise. 
I took you, he's saying this to David, I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and note this language, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, and I will provide a place for my people Israel. And will plant them so that they can become a home, that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. Now you heard that in 2 Samuel 7, you're like, that's a great promise. But you get to chapter 8 and you might forget that. Which is why D.A. Carson pulls glasses down, kind of look at you from the podium and remind you a text without a context as a pretext for a proof text. The accounts of David's victories here are showing God making good on what he said. In fact, it's hard to see just with the way it's laid out. If you've got your Bibles open and you're looking at it, you're not going to see this. But, but, but it actually is describing something in the form of a, of, of a picture. Meaning each of David's victories are organized geographically. Verses 1 to 14, in each of those battles, it is one particular direction. First, he goes west. Then he goes east. Then he goes north. And then he goes south. What are you seeing when you see four directions being mentioned? An expansion. This growth. God providing. Remember what I read a few minutes ago? A place for his people. Victory over his enemies. Literally, right after God promised it, David has overwhelming victory. Is there any question who was behind all of that? David's conquest begins in verse 1 with the defeat of the Philistines to the west. Then David moves east and wins against Moab. A long discussion of verses, in verses 3 to 12, David turns north, north to fight Hadadezer. And finally, his wars end with battles against the Edomites in the south, verse 14. In this way, here again, remember the text well, out of context is a pretext for a proof text. Not just the context of the Old Testament or 2 Samuel. Think of the context of the whole Bible, right? Put it in the context of the whole Bible. Scripture is showing us how David extended the kingdom to the four points of the compass. Here I'm going, imagine where I'm going with this. Why would God want to show the beginning of an expansion that would go in all four points of the compass? Because he wants us to see symbolically, typologically, the extension of David's kingdom to the four corners of the earth, the domain that belongs to the ascended King Jesus. When, when Greg described, oh, 4,000 tongues to sing, did you think of tongues as languages? I mean, that image is so beautiful. Like, I, I had a hard time singing the first part of that song because I thought, oh, it's, it's not just, it's not just, just people in one little region singing that song. Just picture all the nations in all the languages with all their garb, cultural garb. Just imagine them all singing praises to God who is the king of all of them. That's the image that song wants you to think of. And this text is pointing to that. You can just hear God saying, do you see where this is going? Do you see where the story's going? I mean, it's fitting that we cover this text on Pentecost Sunday. When the Spirit of God came down to all people, it wasn't even just those who were descended from the tribe of Israel. By the grace and mercy of God, when the Spirit came down, it came down to believing Gentiles too. And that's why even in 2 Samuel chapter 8, the text is wanting you to think of how far north can we go? How far south can we go? How far east can we go? How far west can we go? Ah, that promise that God made was even bigger than David may have first imagined. But now, in light of the context of Scripture as a whole, what a beautiful picture. So that 
we can write songs like oh for a thousand languages to sing and know that second samuel 8 is the beginning of that it's interesting to note just a side note that the boundaries of this mini the beginning of this kingdom that god has established this mini empire actually lines up almost perfectly with what the lord promised to abraham in genesis 15 18 which that text says from the river in Egypt, that's where the Philistines were, to the Euphrates. Well, that's where Hadadezer was dwelling. God will accomplish what he has promised. Now, you and I just need to hear that. Like we need to sit under his word and know what he's promised he will accomplish. In light of the biblical story as a whole, this text is showing how God is working out what he promised to his people, which ends not just with Israel or a small parcel of land, but with the church and all creation. A proof of this is one of the last statements by our Lord Jesus Christ right before he ascended. Matthew 28. 16 to 20. I'm, I'm going to read the text, but it might sound a little Old Testament-ish for you because it's got a mountain. Just like when Moses received the commandments and the formation of God's people at the beginning. Then the 11 disciples went, remember Judas was gone by now. The 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Here's this new Moses this new, expanded, new covenant formation of a people. All of that is symbolized by those words. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's king language. This next verse you may know, we often call it the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And depending on where you live, you've got to go north or south or east or west. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And get this, again, here's this phrase again. Remember God said he was with David? He says, and surely I am with you always. To the very end of the age. Now, again... In that. There it is again. You saw it with David. God was with him. You hear it with Jesus to his church. God is with you. So now I want to look at that last point this morning and this theme that shows up twice. In that text that Randa read, 2 Samuel 8, two identical phrases are used. One in the middle of these wars in all four directions of the compass and one right when they're over. It's in verses 6 and, verse, and 14. It says this, The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. Same thing is stated in verse 14. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. I... When the Bible says something twice, listen twice as hard. The key theme is stated. He gives it to you right there. Now, now a, a couple of thoughts on that. While the translation of the Hebrew word victory makes sense because he's obviously in battles, the word alone means something more like delivered or saved. This statement describes the relationship the Lord has long established with David. This isn't like a new thing. This is kind of stating, if, if you're wondering, this is what the text is saying, if you're wondering, why is David so victorious here? Is it because he's just a, a brilliant leader of armies? Does it because he's got the most powerful weapons, the best soldiers? The text is like, I'm going to give it to you twice. Once in the middle at the halftime and once when the game is over. It was the Lord who was with him and delivered him, saved him, gave him victory. 
I'll give you proof of this. I'm going to just recount. I'm going to read a few texts, but just from 1 Samuel and then one in 2 Samuel, where you see this exact same language used about the presence of the Lord. 1 Samuel 16, 18, one of Saul's servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man. And then he adds this statement, and the Lord is with him. 1 Samuel 8, 12 through 14. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David. In everything he did, David, he had great success because the Lord was with him. You, 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 you note that? 2 Samuel 7, verse 9. I have been with you wherever you have gone. And then you get to 2 Samuel 8. Remember D.A. Carson with the glasses looking down? Maybe that was only me that got scared of that. A text without a context is a pretext or a proof text. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. In the context of this passage, in our passage today, it is God's protective and powerful presence that provided him deliverance and victory. So what does that mean for us today? Let, let's just ask that question. How do we take this for Christians today? Well, uh, just a couple thoughts on that. One would be this. The primary ministry of God in Scripture is making himself known and present to us. David is projecting the kind of relationship God has with all of his children. Hear that this morning. From Genesis, the beginning of the Bible, to Revelation, God is the one who pursues, God is the one who comes, God is the one who unites himself to us, and in the end of the story, God will finally and fully dwell with his people. The whole gospel message is about God making himself known, being with his people, powerfully so. God unites to us now on this Pentecost Sunday, as, as Greg and, and Casey have already addressed. How does he unite himself to us? by the will of the Father who sent the Son through the person and work of Jesus Christ and by the ministering and indwelling presence of the Spirit. You are not alone. As one of God's children, you constantly have the Father constantly have the Father ministering to you. Do you, you understand this? Again, remember what I prayed when, when, when we were starting? If you, if you heard that and you heard me say about the, the, imagine the different kinds of places people are coming from as they enter into church this morning. I know firsthand that there are some who sit here who are so burdened with suffering. I know firsthand that there are some who come here who are celebrating the birth of a grandchild. <clears throat> Same room. Same Lord. And this text is reminding God's covenant people <coughs> that God is powerfully present among you. So you can ask the question, uh, how do, we, how do we read this rightly? I don't want to miss this. That's why the second applicational thought I want to give to you today is not just that the primary ministry of God in Scripture is making himself known and present to us, but this, that the powerful presence of the Lord means ultimate victory, even if not everything is a victory, or there's lots of little moments of difficulty 
or crisis? Gideon asked this question in the book of Judges, and I'm sure all of us have asked it at one time or another. This is from Judges chapter 6. Here's what Gideon says. If the Lord is with us, there's that, see that language, with us? Like, you read this passage like, yes, God's with us. Should we fight north, south, east, or west? We got this. Gideon asked the question, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? The context, again, might be important. The the Israelites were disheartened in Judges 6 by the Midianites' continual oppression. To many, like Gideon, these hardships didn't make sense if God was truly with his people. They had heard the stories of God's power, but since they had never seen it displayed, they doubted his presence. That's why Gideon asked, almost sarcastically, where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us? Can you not hear a Christian saying that today? That's great, Mickey. Love 2 Samuel 8. Good for David. That's not what I feel now. It feels like he's not with me now. Again, Gideon's question, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? That's why we have to be careful. Text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. The example of David in our text today might lead some Christians, even those who take God's word seriously, to interpret these examples as prescriptive. As long as God is with me, I cannot lose. This is what true faith looks like. What God's presence must accomplish on our behalf. Watch out, world, here I come. That's a verse of the prosperity gospel. That, that kind of interpretation of this text has no room for suffering. No room for loss. No room for brokenness. No room for waiting. No place for lament. In reality, however, God's presence only guarantees that God will accomplish in the end what he has promised. That's the only official guarantee that by the end of the game, it's a victory. Doesn't tell you what the score at halftime is going to be. At the end of the game, all evil will be defeated and judged. There will be a new creation and a glorious heavenly banquet for God's people. And I'm assuming that a thousand tongues will be present. But until then, there could be lots of little moments of questions like Gideon asked. If God is with us, why? If if you want proof of this, we don't even have to wait for a different biblical book. It won't be long till David himself is proof that all his victories in this moment do not mean that he does not face failure or that he does not endure suffering as we are about to see. So what's the point? Why why do I say this? This is is where I want to close us. So beside ultimate victory, what does God's powerful presence mean for us? Like, we know ultimate victory, got it. But in the now, in the first half, what's that mean? Two things. One is that God is ministering through us. This is such an important biblical point. Whatever the source, whatever caused the issue, whether it was something we did or something done to us, God will make a good solution. And proof of this are Jesus' own teaching with his disciples in John chapter 9. I love this story. His disciples see a blind man from birth. How they knew he was born blind from birth, who knows? But they see him and they say, Rabbi, who sinned? Look at they're, they're looking at source, not solution. Who sinned? This man or his parents? that he was born blind. They're they're thinking cause and effect. 
Listen to Jesus' words. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He's not saying they weren't sinners. You mean they weren't? That's not, don't think of just the cause. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, you may not want to volunteer for that role, but let me just put it in context. In a broken and fallen world, with what feels like chaos and destruction that befalls by common curse all of us in different ways, God can use what was caused by evil for good to make his name great. But the second application is not just that God's powerful presence means that he's ministering through us, but it means that God is present with us. Remember Jesus' words? And surely I am with you always, always, always. In the midst of suffering, God is caring for his children. God is guiding his children. God is protecting his children. God is comforting his children. You hear those words today. Those of you who come in here with deep worries, facing severe crises, or you just sit there broken, broken. Your God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God who was with David, the God who manifests himself through the person and work of Jesus Christ, the God who descended upon his people at Pentecost that we celebrate today, the God who is present in this sacred gathering of his, done in his name, is with you in your suffering. Praise be to God. You can not be surprised that with that kind of a testimony, it would not even be fully sufficient for a thousand languages to sing his praises. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would minister to us through your word week after week. We want to sit under it. We want to read it rightly in its context. But we want our hearts to be formed by it. Father, I pray for the sweet Christian brother or sister who sits here in suffering, that you would minister to them in personal, powerful ways. Remind them even from this word that you are with them always. Thank you that your spirit that we celebrate coming today is called the comforter and help us to believe your word even when it hurts and when it's hard we pray in jesus name